Season 9 of Night School is presented by the AQHA. Bet on the Grade 2 West Texas Futurity this Sunday at Sunland Park. Keeneland Select. Hit the late pick four on Derby Day and split 50,000 points. Woodbine. Catch live thoroughbred racing at Woodbine and standard bread racing at Woodbine Mohawk Park. Remington Park. Live quarter horse racing Thursday through Sunday with a noon first post on Kentucky Derby Day. And Express Bet. Home of the $25,000 Preakness Big Bet Sweepstakes. sound crazy, but for me, it's intellectual stimulation. Class is now in session. It's time for night school. Here are your hosts. Riders up. It's night school 2019 season nine. I'm Jeremy Plunk from Horse Player Now, along with Brian W. Spencer, general manager of Horse Player Now. We call for riders up because tonight, Jockey angles are the topic of discussion. Brian, this is like racing's dirty little secret, like the click in the cafeteria. Everybody's got a crush on the girl that nobody wants to admit, but they all like her, but they don't want to say it. Every handicapper you talk to say jockeys don't matter. Trainers say jockeys don't matter. Owners say jockeys don't matter. Even other jockeys say the jockey doesn't matter, that it's all about the horse. Then they rip up their tickets and say, that damn Velasquez beat me again. They go back and look at the tote board, and the jockeys who are the popular jockeys and the well-known and the high-percentage jockeys are always the favorite. Yet jockeys don't matter. Come clean with me, Brian. You know, uh, I, I'm feeling a little attacked at the moment because <laughs> I have for years been one of those, uh, you know, I'm not a jockey guy type guys. And then listening to you explain that, yeah, that is me. I will explain to you how, you know, some jockey uh, once again out finished the other jocks in the colony. So, you know, maybe I'm a little bit more of a jockey guy than I uh, really think I am. But I think it it sort of goes to, you know, we, we talked a couple weeks ago about trainer angles, and I think it sort of goes to some of the discussions we had there when jockeys are riding a horse for the first time or when jockeys are doing something uh, specific with a horse that they haven't done before. I think certain riders fit certain horses in certain situations better, and I think that's sort of where I've started to uh, started to come around into uh, maybe uh, being willing to admit that I'm a little bit of a jockey guy. Part of it, I think, is the statistics that are available. There's not a lot of high-end data on jockeys in the mainstream, right? I mean you get their win percentage at the meet, and that's kind of about it. The Brisnet past performances give you a little bit more on maybe how a jockey with a trainer has done over the last 60 days or how they fit with a particular running style uh, based on, on the Briss and the, and the Quirin uh, uh, categories of, of different styles of pace. But there's not a lot of data out there like we see in the trainer angle. So there isn't this great colony of people who are you know boasting that that jockey a or jockey b is in a perfect position uh to win today you don't get a lot of that discussion i think the other part of it is there is a little bit of machismo involved in handicapping well there's a lot of machismo involved in handicapping but but there is an element of it that says any bloke with a program can look down and bet julian leperu at keeneland or bet flavian Pratt in california or bet florent Giroux uh down in new orleans you know anybody can just go bet the leading jockey so i think there's this sense of if you bet the leading jockey in a race even if they're on the best horse or there's a re- good reason for it that that you're some kind of lemming who's just following the pack and you're not doing any serious handicapping but for me i think the jockeys are vastly underappreciated in their ability uh, to influence the outcome of a race. Think of this. Each second on the racetrack is five lengths. Each fifth of a second is one length. Decision-making from the opening bell until they get around the racetrack, a minute ten for six furlongs or or two minutes for a mile and a quarter. How many one-fifth of a second decisions did a jockey make during the course of the running of that race? You start to add those up, and you can – 
easily see how a jockey can start costing a horse one length, two lengths, three lengths, four lengths. They may not make them run faster. No jockey can pick up a horse and make them run faster. Totally agree with that uh, assessment. But it's almost like scoring gymnastics. You start off with a perfect 10, and each flaw starts to go down a point. You know, We're going to take off for this. We're going to take off for that. That, to me, is the importance of a great rider. A perfect ride is a 10 where there were no mistakes made. Each fifth of a second that they mess up and are indecisive or get stuck behind another horse or wrestle with a horse who doesn't need wrestled with starts to deduct from that perfect score. And those are lengths on the racetrack, just not scores on the board. So, Brian, I think that jockeys are very important to the outcome of a race. I think the tote board suggests that. But how do we make money off the jockeys, even if we give that theory that I'm uh, that, that I'm po- posting out there, if we give that theory credit and credence, how do we make money off of playing jockeys? Because typically when you look at the tote board, the top two or three guys in the colony are the top two or three on the tote. Well, you know, I love the way that you kind of compared it to a gymnastics score because, yeah, when every – if you consider every ride a 10, when they all load in the gate, everybody starts with a 10, and it goes from there. So uh, I think that kind of goes into one of the biggest things I love. My favorite jockeys are just the ones that I notice the least because they make the fewest mistakes. So that's one of the things that, you know, I like the guys who I barely ever pay attention to, Javier Castellano, Florent Giroux, Johnny Velasquez, those kind of guys who just go about their business and do good work and get horses home to win. I think one of the things that is key, though, if we want to kind of move this into how important are jockeys from point A to point B of how do we make money by thinking about jockeys, I think a big thing is when horses and jockeys are teaming up for the first time, especially if that jockey possesses a skill set or skill sets that really match up nicely with that horse. We've got some, uh, you know, we've got riders around the country who are very well known for getting horses out of the gate. So if now they're picking up a speed horse they've never ridden before who maybe has some gate troubles, you know, maybe that's going to be a chance for me to give that horse another opportunity with a good gate rider aboard for the first time. It's just, you know, just like a barn change. Anything that a jockey can do to potentially help a horse reach his or her potential the best or on the flip side like you've kind of alluded to keep them from uh you know failing to reach it by not impeding them i think that that really is where the jockey can help and that's how you can make money yeah, style fits and clashes are a big deal. You know, does that jockey style fit with the particular horse? The other thing is, is if you take the premise that the top jockeys get the top horses and that's why they're the top dogs. What happens when the top jockeys start to ride for people who aren't the top barns? I think that is a great jockey angle. Let's say you've got one of the leading jockeys, top two or three in the standings, riding for a 6% trainer. All of a sudden, you start to wonder, why is this guy riding for a 6% barn? The agent for the horse who helps book the mounts, work in the back stretch. Somebody that 6% trainer says, I've got one who's really good right now and ready to run, and I've got a great spot for him, and, and here's why this horse hasn't been running well lately. We fixed something with them, you know, along those lines. Something is right. The light bulb has got on, and now all of a sudden, the 20% rider is riding for a 6% barn. I think that's one of the great angles in, in jockey handicapping that you want to jump on. High percentage jock for a low percentage barn, that's a big thumbs up for me. Yeah, especially if it kind of comes out of nowhere, too. You know, you see this, mm-hmm. I think, I think you see a lot of that at Keeneland over the course of their, uh, you know, short meets in the spring and fall. But, uh, yeah, you get that a lot at every track. You know, every now and then you open up the past performances and you see, uh, you know, the number one or number two guy riding for somebody who's won one or two races at the meet. And uh, it becomes kind of curious, but that, you know, is another one of those, one of these things happening for the first time kind of situations where I think you can use that as a, uh, as a potential indicator that there are maybe good things to come. I think that's a really big one as well. And layoff horses under that same line. You know, a horse is coming off a long layoff. What jockey assignment is on this runner? He's away six months, eight months, nine months. Is a top rider taking them out, or have they gone to a low percentage jockey? If you see a low percentage jockey aboard a horse coming off a layoff, that tells me, look, the horse went on the shelf for physical reasons and hasn't come back that well because a top rider is not willing to take the mount first time back. If a good rider is willing to ride, especially the rider who maybe rode that horse even, and they stay loyal to the horse uh, six months later, that tells me it's a good sign that the horse is coming back with some intent and maybe not for this start, but they think this horse is back where he should be and, and will shortly be back in good form. Because look, these riders, the top riders can ride, you know, 
multiple horses in each race if their agent uh, so chooses to, to try to get them on their horses. So when they take a mount on a horse coming off a layoff, if there's not just like an obvious situation where this jockey always rides for this trainer, I think it's something you want to look at. High percentage rider on a layoff horse, good thing. Low percentage rider on a layoff horse, a bad thing. We talk a lot about the percentages. They're hard to find with jockeys. Again, there's not a lot of data out there without going next gen statistics. You know, If you get into the bris and the all way stats and things like that, you can dig out some of this stuff. Uh, Bet Mix has some very good statistics that I've been utilizing with Express Bet uh, over the past year or so. And I've used those data mines to kind of look at some of these jockeys and try to determine some jockey angles that I like to see. One of the things I really like to look at is what is a jockey's percentage riding favorites? You'll be surprised. And actually on the Equibase, if you go into the each meet stats, you can get uh, the at-a-glances and, and things like that with the Equibase stats for free. That will give you the percentages on favorites. Figure your favorites win about 38% of the time at racetracks around the country. What jockeys are winning less than or more than 38% with favorites? Because the favorite is supposed to win. And if the jockeys are on horses that are the best horse in the race – the number of mistakes they make, as we talked about with that gymnastics comparison, would tell you that they should win 38 percent or more if they're a good jockey when they have the best horse. And you would be surprised. I mean the difference between the Ortiz brothers in the last year, Irad Ortiz rides favorites at a big percentage above the 38 percent norm. Jose Ortiz is well below the 38 percent norm when riding favorites over the past year at Gulfstream Park. Uh, interesting uh, and something to look at, you know, that when they have the best horse – who delivers? And again, if you look at Jose and Irad Ortiz, you may not be able to separate them two in talent. But when they have the best horse, Irad delivers at a much higher rate than Jose. Some interesting angle to look at. The other thing I like to look at is jockeys in large field sizes. And this, again, you need next-gen stats to look at, but a bet mix or a bris all way, something like this, which you can work with if you want to get into it a little bit deeper – Look at how jockeys ride in large field sizes because that's where all the traffic is. Large field sizes are also where the percentages payoffs go up. You know, We get a higher payoff in the larger field sizes, so those are where jockeys can really make a difference. How many decisions do you need to make in a six-horse field? Not that many, but when you get a 10-, 12-horse field, who is winning at a higher percentage and making the decisions and scoring at a higher ROI? Look at your jockeys in large field sizes who succeed, and you can find some good money angles that way playing the jockeys. Brian, your final thoughts? Well, you know, I, I think we covered a lot of those too. That big field thing is also very interesting. But yeah, it's basically the outliers to the overall statistics that interest me. You mentioned the Ortiz brothers and their favorites. But yeah, you see a guy who's riding 26% at a meet, you know, a leading rider somewhere, but might be, you know, 41% on the dirt and 8% on the turf. Maybe that's an extreme example. But, uh, you know, by and large, figuring out where those outliers are compared to the overall statistical uh, profile of a jockey, I think, is where you can find the spots where riders are doing their best work. In the night school vault we go tonight and into the saddle with one of the all-time greats. Jerry Bailey joined us in night school a few years back and shared his thoughts on jockey angles. After you hear from the NBC Sports commentator, we'll have Kate and Bradar joining us in night school for her thoughts on jockey angles. racing from Woodbine and Mohawk Park. Thoroughbred and Harness Action. The wagers are just the beginning. Watch award-winning broadcasts covering both breeds. Incredible battles contested over the most unique grass course in North America. Experience the full field with over 130 Thoroughbred and 160 live harness days. Get access to free handicapping material and join the ranks of Woodbine and Mohawk Park players from all over the globe. For more information, visit woodbine.com. Strategize, analyze, select. Join Keeneland Select to bet on racing from around the world on your computer, tablet, or smartphone anytime, anywhere. Featuring the best rewards in racing, free pass performances, live video, race replays, and more. Plus, Keeneland Select invests a portion of its profits back into the sport. Join Keeneland Select today and earn a $150 sign-up bonus at KeenelandSelect.com. Dedicated to the sport and dedicated to the players. Folks like to bet on the horses. Some like to bet on the games. 
Some folks like to bet on their phone. And some like to bet from their suite. So what's your best bet? All of the above. No matter how you like to bet, Remington Park is your best bet yet. With world-class horse racing, OKC's newest casino and online suite booking now available. Remington Park, it's your best bet yet. Hey, what's going on? Mikey here, and I'm going to tell you about an offer from my good friends at Express Bet. Let's be honest. We know you love playing the races, but you can't always make it to the track. Sometimes life just gets in the way of a good bet. Well, what if I told you about a place where you never miss a bet and you start with house money? You'd say I'm crazy, right? Well, not at Express Bet. Your first $100 are on them. That's right. Sign up with ExpressBet.com using promo code XBRADIO, bet 100 bucks, and they'll deposit 100 bucks back into your account the very next day. Hey, plus you could get an extra 25 bucks if you use Express Fund Direct Deposit. You see what I mean? House money for betting the races. It's that easy. Check it out at ExpressBet.com to learn more. And don't forget to sign up for promo code XBRADIO. You're gonna love it. And that's a Mikey guarantee. Must be 18 years or older and 21 years old in certain states to open an account with Express Bet and reside in a state where such activity is legal. Void or prohibited. National Gambling Support Line 800 522 4700. Welcome back to the show. Enjoy this classic night school clip from the vault. Well, I mean, look, look at the best jockeys get the best horse, so it's kind of a, a snowball effect. Get 22, the, you know, the better you're riding, the better your mounts. Um, and we're only as good as the clients we ride for and the horses we're, that we're on. Um, but th- there's a reason why the guys at the top are at the top and that they win more. They, they make more right choices than others. But, you know, I, I always felt, you know, there wasn't really a lot of difference between the top 20 guys in the country. You know, if you wanted to find it more locally, the top three guys at a given track, it's who's riding with the most confidence at the time or who's riding for clients, trainers that are winning at a high clip, you know. Guy, guy, look at Todd Pletcher, whoever he puts on, they're, they're going to be very, very successful. The, the guy is just in, winning an insane clip uh, in the last 10 years. So um, those guys, Johnny V um, in, in New York, Javier uh, Castellano now rides, you know, probably more horses for Pletcher than, than Johnny Velasquez does. So those are the guys that win races because they do make good decisions, but they're also riding for guys that win races. Russell Bayes rides for Hollendorfer out, out in you know in Northern California. Um, you know whoever rides for Pepper is going to win, whether it be Martin Garcia, Bay Hirano, whoever it is, Mike Smith it is going to win. But you know I, I always looked at it as is guys in in big races. Okay, I've got a. a, a a huge take on this, and and uh, with few exceptions. I mean, I think riders ride horses best the way the horses want to run. And if you have no preconceived idea of how a horse wants to run, you're pretty much going to let him run how he wants to run. Uh, if I won a race on a horse last, you know, October, uh, chances are I'm going to try and duplicate that exact ride. Okay, he was stiff by four lengths and he moved up on the inside. Those are the kind of conditions I'm going to try and replicate. But, you know, every race is different. Every situation is different. So if you allow, as a jockey, if you allow the horse to run the way they run best, you're going to be more successful. And the way they run best, a lot of times, is what you're presented with with the first time you ride them. I mean, because, you, you, you know, I don't have an experience with this horse, so I'm going to just kind of, kind of let him run, the, you know, within reason the way he runs, wants to run best. It's like getting in a car. And you know how to drive a car. You, okay, you warm the horse up, you get the car, you adjust the mirrors, you adjust the seat, and then everything else is pretty much the same. That's the way I feel about riding horses the first time. Hmm. They're going to run the best the way they want to run. Reaching the end of the episode on jockeys and jockey angles, and that makes it a time for a visit from Caton Bradar. And Caton, jockey's probably some of the uh, most polarizing figures in racing. I think uh, a lot of players either love them or hate them from one day to the next, but obviously they have a very difficult job, and uh, a lot of different factors go into uh, not only being a jockey, obviously, but from a horse-playing perspective, what do we do when we notice jockey changes? Uh, how do jockeys fit certain horses uh, how much stock do you put into who's riding any given horse and or the changes that may come from rider to rider well being the granddaughter of a hall of fame jockey and married to a jockey agent who's a uh, very good jockey who's sort of enhanced our, our quality of life i probably place an inordinate amount of um, 
of emphasis on jockeys in the equation. Fair. But, uh, but I do, I, I think that not all jockeys are created equal. Now, that's not to say that any number of jockeys could ride any given horse. And certain horses, really good horses especially, could probably be ridden by almost anybody and still be successful because it is more the horse than it is the jockey. But at the end of the day, a good jockey can make the difference, especially in a close finish, um, especially when uh, a judge of pace or ability to save some horse or a strong finish is needed. And I think that I pay attention to jockey switches when we're going from, say, a less experienced jockey or an apprentice jockey to a super talented jockey. Um, To me, that's a big switch uh, as far as experience goes. Um, I think that I pay attention if there's a jockey that just seems to have been in a slump and really just has not had the right moves, even if they are very good jockeys. And now we suddenly go to a jockey that is in the groove where they seem to be winning on anything. I think those are significant switches that you have to take into consideration. And then I think you have to look at there are particular jockeys who have a style that you come to know and respect. And so when I see Kendrick Carmouche on a a particular horse that I I'm wondering, would the connections want this horse to go to the lead? Do they think that maybe he's better if he's forwardly placed? And then I see them make a change to a Kendrick Carmouche, who is such a good gate rider or a Paco Lopez here in South Florida. You'll see frequently, you know, it's not a secret what the strategy is going to be. They're going to try to put those horses on the lead. I think that um, there are just certain jockeys that are extremely good at that and adept at somehow getting the horses into the game a little bit earlier. Uh, But you have to also pay attention to the unexpected because there are certain riders that become typecast to something and it's a misnomer. Um, If if you watch the t- what they're capable of, they can do anything. And a, a really good example is a Julian LaPeru. Julian, everyone expects Julian LaPeru is going to take a horse back off the pace because he's a patient rider and he has ridden a lot of exceptional turf horses and horses that have been um, really done well with that type of a style. But what people don't realize is Julian is very, very good on a lead horse. If you have a horse with speed and you tell him, a trainer has instructed him, you know, let him break and go to the lead and go on with it, he's as good as anybody you're going to see on that type of a horse. So I, I think the expectation is very different from the reality sometimes with the jocks. And you also have to consider that most of the time jockeys are riding to instructions. They've been told to ride a horse a certain way, and most jockeys – will try to ride to whatever they're told to ride to versus what they think they should be doing on their own. Um, That's for right or for wrong. That's just what I have come to learn in talking to trainers and in in talking to jockeys as well. So um, it's a mistake, in my opinion, to typecast too much, but it is helpful to be able to see what is sometimes happening when trainers are going to certain jockeys. And finally, the, the, I think, you can't underestimate certain trainer jockey combinations. There are just certain combinations that click and you know that the trainer has confidence in the jockey and the jockey obviously has confidence in the trainer when he puts him on a horse. So when you see those combos, you have to take note of it and and consider it and use that in your handicapping as well. Because I I do think that that um, says a lot about what the trainer is hoping for in the outcome. And with this discussion of jockeys, we've reached the midpoint of the first semester of Season 9 of Night School. Thank you to Kate and Bradar for her thoughts here on tonight's episode. We'll be back again next Tuesday with a discussion of win betting, place betting, show betting. We're going to take it back to the simplest bets we can find. We'll talk to you then next week. FAQ 60 track bias. 
track bias occurs when a portion of the racetrack is more favorable to horses traveling over it than another part of the track. Weather and track maintenance can cause biases, but many times an apparent bias is merely a coincidence of the best horses winning from similar post positions. When identifying a track bias, look at the horse's odds in question. Are favorites or long shots performing well or poorly from the perceived to be biased area? Write down the posts for top finishers in each race and where they raced, as well as their odds. You might uncover a track bias. Track biases in quarter horse racing deal with favorable running lanes rather than a favorable running style in thoroughbred racing because the short line combatants use the entire width of the track. This FAQ 60 is brought to you by AQHA Racing and Horse Player Now. Enjoyed tonight's episode? Check out hundreds of past archives at horseplayernow.com.